We have a time of discussion or questions and answers. If anybody would like to make a comment or ask a question. Sam. Um, so you touched on this in your, in your speech, but I just want to ask, what do you think about, and, and considering the call that you mentioned to, to break forth the children, you know, in our, in our modern day, people want to, you know, complete their studies, four years of university, get a job, work a couple of years, get a mortgage, have a house, you know, all these things. Like, when should a person, a reformed person, start looking for a spouse and get married? Could everybody hear the question? Sam, I don't believe that we can put an age on when a reformed person ought to start. In fact, I would be hesitant even to suggest an age when a reformed person ought to start. But the trend in our society today is not towards younger marrying, but towards older marrying. And I think the brakes ought to be put on that trend. You mentioned several reasons that a, a young man or young woman might put off marriage for a time. And in our society, there are certain circumstances that we simply have to deal with. So there may be some legitimate reasons to put off uh, marrying until later. But when the Reformers faced this question of marrying, and when they were correcting the Roman Catholic error, especially Luther acknowledged nature never ceases nature never ceases and that was luther's way of saying that god has created us with a certain appetite as men and certain desires as women there's a sexual appetite and sexual desires that are part of our creation and that are not in themselves sinful appetites god created man male and female and then brought them together in marriage. And Luther's point when he said nature never ceases is that that desire for uh, fulfilling that appetite uh, never, desire, or, or never ceases in the heart of a man and a woman. And he used that then to advise that a man and a woman get married and that they entirely reject what Rome was telling them that they should remain unmarried. Now we can maybe apply something of that to your question. Nature never ceases. If there's a young man or a young woman who finds that that desire is strong, for that appetite is strong in them, then they ought to begin seeking a spouse. And that's not just Luther's advice. That's the command, in fact, of the Word of God in 1 Corinthians 7. It is better to marry than to burn. And the idea there is to burn in lust. It is better to marry than to burn. And so to avoid fornication, let every one of you have his own wife and every woman her own husband. There, there may be other ways to answer your question, Sam. The appetite that God has created in males and females is not the only way to answer the question. But that, I think, is one important way to answer the question. Um, let us not put off for earthly reasons what may lead us into fornication because nature never ceases. Sam, do you have any follow-up to that or any further thoughts? I, I have a follow-up question about children. Let's see if there's anyone else who wants to comment on yeah. that first question you asked first. Any comments or follow-up questions to that issue? Okay, Sam. Uh, so it's very much related. Um, we have a calling to, uh, to bring forth children. Um, obviously, in our modern day, people physically control that in various ways. And also, with people getting married later in life, there's more difficulty in having children, and then raising children who are that bit older and less energy. Have you, you have some advice about that? All right, that, that's a, could everybody hear the question again? That's an avenue to answer your first question, actually, that I hadn't, 
necessarily thought of on the spur of the moment, but I think there's something to that. The calling for a married couple is to bring forth children. Now, of course, that's subject to the, the providence of God, as we've heard. But the calling is to bring forth children. And that calling can be fulfilled uh, more robustly in younger years than it can be perhaps in older years. So I think that might be another way to, to encourage younger seeking of spouses rather than waiting and putting it off. Sam, am I catching what you were asking, or, or do you have a yeah, further point that you'd like to make? I guess I have, a, have an opinion, but already. We'd love to hear your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else on that matter or other questions that you have? Reverend Seward. Um, there's a pamphlet on the table. I think we only have two or three left by a PR minister. If Sam would like to read that, that's one possible one. Wait to answer the question. Or Sam could hand it out to others if he wants to <laughs> making his opinion. Well, yeah, very good. Appreciate that recommendation. Dr. Kennedy. I've never heard this verse properly explained in your forum circles, and I don't mind if you put it off to a later date. It's 1 Corinthians 7 29. This I say, brethren, the time is short. It remains that both they that have wives be as though they are man. Dr. Kennedy, let me take a stab at that now. And then if others want to give their exegesis of that, I'd be very open to that and welcoming of it. Paul's point here is concerning family relationships and especially marriage. That's what he's dealing with in 1 Corinthians 7. He's answering questions that they wrote to him, as chapter 7, verse 1 indicates. Now concerning the things, things whereof he wrote unto me, and the question must have been something along the lines of, should I get married or is it okay to remain single? And Paul begins to answer that question, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. 1 Corinthians 7 is going to be the chapter we look at more in depth than on Friday morning regarding it is good to be single. There is the declaration of the word of God, it is good not to touch a woman, it is good to be single. And he continues to give that advice regarding marriage and family uh, throughout this chapter. But then he indicates that marriage and family life is not the ultimate end of life. It's not the ultimate goal of our human existence. It's a good gift. It takes up a, a lot of our time and energy, rightly so. But it's not the end all of man. And the ultimate goal of man is to glorify God. And so in verse 29, when he says, It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, um, he isn't saying, if you're married, pretend you're not. <laughs> but what he's saying is, don't let that be the, the end of your life. Don't let that be the main goal. With your spouse, serve the Lord. And especially, he writes that, because the time is short. The Lord is returning. And if the time was short then, the time is certainly short now. So we are with our families to give ourselves to the worship of God, to the things of the kingdom, preparing for the Lord and His return, while at the same time living according to all of the other uh, commands He gives us in the Word regarding married life. Would someone else like to uh, add some thoughts to that? Dr. Kennedy, you too, if you have your own thoughts. Uh, to me, it means be as devoted to the Lord as if you were single. Okay, beautiful. You said simply what I said clumsily. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else thoughts on that verse or other questions or comments? Yes, Brian. Uh, you mentioned briefly about the authority, you know, on earth 
regarding marriage, church, state, and family. Um, I was wondering if, uh, again, if it can be a later date necessary, but if you can expand a little more on that, because I don't think, or if you could point me to somewhere that, that deals with that issue more directly. And what is the authority of the church? What is the authority of the state? What is the authority of the families involved in marriage? <coughs> and, well, there's more, but I'll leave it at that. Okay, all right. Marriage is a civil ordinance. It's an, a creation ordinance. And therefore, it's under the authority of the civil government, which means that the state has a role. And in some sense, we might also say, almost say the decisive role in marrying. And we practice that in the Protestant Reformed churches. I assume that's practiced in the British Isles, that when we have a wedding ceremony, though we do it in a church building, and though it's attended by the people of God, that when we have that marriage ceremony, at the moment of solemnization of that marriage, the minister does not say, according to the ordinances of the church, but he says, according to the laws of the state of California, or the laws of the UK, whatever, whatever the statement there would be. But we are married according to the, or under the auspices of the civil authorities. The church has a role. It definitely has a role. And its role is to see to it that those who marry, marry in the Lord. That's a spiritual role. But the church is not given the authority to solemnize that marriage. That's done by Jehovah himself. Now, in the U.S., any minister of the gospel is automatically authorized by the state to solemnize a wedding, solemnize a marriage. So we're married by ministers, but that doesn't mean we're married by the church. The church has a role not only to see to it that those who marry, marry in the Lord, which is our Reformed church order, but they also have a duty to see to it that those who are married behave themselves in, marry, in, in marriage, that they exercise Christian discipline, if the husband and wife do not behave themselves in marriage, they have a duty to encourage the husband and wife through the preaching of the gospel regarding marriage and their callings in it. So the church has all kinds of duties, but the actual authority to solemnize and unite the husband and wife is given to the civil authorities because it's a creation ordinance. Families have a huge role to play in this. Uh, father and mother bring up their children in such a way that they know what kind of a spouse to look for. They forbid them to marry outside of the Lord. They warn them if the children are going in that direction. They encourage them when they are seeking a spouse in the Lord. Uh, and there's yeah, a thousand other ways that parents would have a role in this. But the actual solemnization is done by the state. That does raise the question, what would happen if a young man and young woman decided they're going to elope and run away from dad and mom and get married before a justice of the peace with a witness from who knows where, and that would be a valid marriage, but how would the church handle that? And there's something in our Reformed church form about um, having our marriage publicly confirmed before witnesses in, in sight of family, something along those lines. So we would, if we could get a hold of that young man and young woman who eloped, we would warn them and rebuke them for that wrong decision. All right, now, I haven't been sensitive to all the different circumstances that may come in to marriage and a young man and young woman deciding to marry, but again, that's a long answer to a short question. Brian, you have a follow-up to that? Uh, I have a few more questions, but maybe too many for this time. <laughs> but just real fast, uh, it's just, so what about um, if, what, I, I know it's kind of a what-if question, but 
if the state for some reason refuses to grant authority. Yeah, I let us down the what if questions by saying what if they elope, so we'll entertain one hypothetical. What if the state does say they may not get married? And that may be a real persecution that the people of God face when the state is against the church during the time of the Antichrist. I don't know that Antichrist will give his stamp of approval to reformed godly marriages. And on that day, I'm not sure exactly what we might do my inclination is to say there still must be a way for godly men and women to get married. There still must be a way, though the state government will not allow it. And that's because this institution of marriage as a creation ordinance supersedes even the civil government. It's God's creation ordinance, not the government's creation ordinance. So there must be some way, but what the practical way to work that out is, I don't know for sure. Yes? I think you've already asked, answered them, I just didn't understand. Um, you said originally that it was the civil authority's responsibility to sort of give the official stamp to it, otherwise it wouldn't be viewed as a marriage. Is that, is that correct? And then you just said it's God's creation ordinance the government authority. I'm a bit lost, sorry. Okay. Yep, thanks for helping me clarify that. The, the fact that it's a creation ordinance means that God has given authority to the civil government to officiate these marriages and make it a marriage. But if the civil government rebels against God, that doesn't tie the hands of God for somehow marrying his people yet. There may be other ways which I don't have any idea what they would be. Now, this would be a, an extreme situation. Maybe it's not even wise for me to suggest there might be other ways. Maybe simply the principle has to be established here that God has instituted marriage. It's up to him to give authority to whom he will to marry. And now, in our present circumstances, that belongs to the civil authorities. Does that help or... or okay. Anyone else follow up? Greg? Just more of a comment. I think that uh, doesn't the Bible say that people will be given up to marriage to the end times, like to the very yeah. end? Yeah, that's an interesting point. <laughs> that when the Lord returns, they will be doing what they were in the days of Noah, which is eating and drinking and marrying up until the flood came, which implies, I suppose, that they will be eating and drinking and marrying right up until the Lord returns. But then the question is, who is it that's doing that marrying? In the days of Noah, it was the ungodly. They were insensible of the coming flood, though they should have been sensible of it. And so in the last times, too, the world certainly will be marrying. The question is, what right will they give to godly people to do that? Candace? There is some comfort in that, because Noah's children were married. All right, good. Good. Anyone else follow up along those lines or other questions? Pete? Yes, I, it, it might be my just lack of knowledge here, but your discussion on the image of God and who he is in the Trinity and then how it's seemingly changed a little bit now introducing this mother this wife and mother in an earthly concept there. I'd almost want you to say that all over again just to get my head, but, be, but no. But uh, is, that, is there a, a place you can point to to uh, follow up on that for a person to read or research? Or is this something you've uh, just sort of thought of? <laughs> it is something I just sort of thought of. <laughs> No, it's, I believe that's the direction that Scripture demands we go. The description of God as a family God in and of himself is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's nothing missing. And so the fact that the symbol that he's given to us of earthly families that include a wife and a mother, that does not 
imply that there's something missing in the being of God himself. He is a complete family God as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But what he has done in the symbol that he's given us is added something to show us the honor he bestows on his church. The honor that he bestows on his church is that he marries her and makes her the mother of his spiritual children through Jesus Christ. And that's tremendous honor. That's, that's The word mind-blowing is overused, but that's mind-blowing honor. We almost stagger at that honor. And again, the honor isn't simply that we boast, not at all that we boast, but that he is so gracious, so merciful, that he takes his bride into his family through Jesus Christ. So we may not read that, we may not read the symbol of, it's trying to reckon, reckon with the fact that in the symbol of family he's given us, there's a wife and a mother that's not in the divine family. But that is present in his covenant with his church. So we may not read that symbol back into the Trinity, but we do account for why the symbol is what it is. Follow up on that? I'll, I'll wait for the book. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> this more. All right. No, I, I appreciate it. All right. Any others with questions or comments about things that have been raised tonight? Done. Thank you for tonight. Um, you were at Tangent at one point talking about the first command of Scripture, and although you didn't allude to it, I think tonight you've shown it in all that you've done. Didn't the first command of Scripture, God gives, let there be light? Ah, very good. So let me clarify the first command to humans. <laughs> good. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Don't want to rush if there's more questions, but if there are no more, we'll, we'll finish there. Anyone yet? Reverend Stewart, what should we do now? Is that we pray? Should we pray again and conclude the evening? Or what would that sound good? Okay. Let's conclude with prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, we give thee thanks for this time to discuss matters that are dear to our hearts, for they are matters of family, but even more so they are matters of thee, our covenant God. We thank thee for thy love in Jesus Christ. We thank thee for the depth of and height, and width, and breadth that we comprehend, but that we comprehend only by faith with all saints, with thy love for us and our Savior. We pray that we may leave from this room tonight with peace in our hearts and joy, knowing our relationship to thee in the covenant of grace, and that we may enjoy that covenant's application in our fellowship in the hours of this evening. Bless us, forgive us, for Jesus' sake, amen.